Welcome everybody to the webinar of today. The speaker of today is François Galère, and he's going to talk about weak nonlinearity for strong non-normality. So as usual, I introduce the speaker very briefly, and then I leave him the floor. So uh, François Galère obtained in uh, 1998 an engineering degree from the Ecole Polytechnique in, uh, in Paris, and in uh, 1999, a master's degree in uh, physics of fluids at the Pierre and Marie Curie University, in, uh, also in Paris. He then joined the laboratory of hydrodynamics, uh, LADIX, uh, at the Ecole Polytechnique, uh, where he defended in uh, 2003 three, uh, a thesis on the theme of instabilities of rotating jets and on the control of vortex breakdown under the direction of uh, Jean-Marc Schumann. In uh, um, 2003, he was appointed CNRS Research Fellow at the JA uh, Didon Laboratory uh, of the University of uh, uh, Nice Sophia Antipolis, and in uh, 2009, he joined the EPFL uh, to fund the uh, Laboratory of Fluid Mechanics and Instabilities, LMF, uh, L LFMI. Uh, LFMI. His uh, research focuses on the study of fundamental stability properties of fluid flows, and he is guided uh, by uh, real-world uh, applications, in particular flow control. Recently, he made contributions in the fields of microfluidics, the stability of free interface flows, uh, damping mechanisms and slushing uh, flows, and the stability of flows around porous obstacles. Uh, François Galère uh, is fellow of the American Physical Society for his fundamental contribution to hydrodynamic instability, balanced on the tripod of theory, numerics, and experiments, with an emphasis on predicting theoretical uh, understanding uh, of vortex dynamics, droplets, coating flows, and theoretical microfluidics. So it's with great pleasure that we have here today Francois Galère uh, to uh, give a talk. So Francois, I stop sharing my screen, and you can start sharing yours. OK, thanks very much, uh, Francesco, for the nice uh, introduction. Um, let me start. And thanks for all for joining for that uh, seminar. So let me just uh, start the slideshow. OK, so I'm going to give a talk which is actually quite vertical in nature. It's, it's a little bit more about a method than about a specific flow case. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a recent method that we, uh, f we developed with Yves-Marie Cynthia, a PhD of mine, and Edouard Bougeot, who works here in the lab as a senior scientist. And so the, the method is, is called weak nonlinearity for strong normality, and I will have to progressively explain these different uh, terms. So. Um, what's known is that in many, many fluids, you will have, let's say, natural and forced oscillations. So here I want to start with three, what I consider representative examples. So the first one is Helmholtz resonators. It's a situation in which you inject, uh, let's say, noise in the system, and you extract a very, very clear frequency out of the system. So there's some sort of resonance. On the lower picture, you see a turbine shear layer. So it's a system which is... Um, um, also fed by noise. If there's no noise in the shear layer, in general, you will not observe any instability. But um, still, the system does amplify massively this noise and with a sort of preferred frequency without having the sharpness of a resonance. And finally, you have uh, situations in which you have spontaneous oscillations forming. They don't even require sustained noise. They can self-develop uh, in a self-sustained way. So these are three examples here for uh, compressible flow, high Reynolds flow, and again, high Reynolds atmospheric flows. And so now I will try to narrow it down to uh, other representative examples of these three categories, um, which we have studied in the lab. So the first one, um, which would be a typical resonance phenomenon on which we have worked recently quite a bit, is sloshing. So in sloshing, you have a set of uh, a group of eigenmodes which can be um, in simple configurations of inviscid uh, potential flow computed analytically with Bessel functions in a, in a cylindrical container. And from that, you can deduce the natural frequencies, resonance frequencies of that system. So it behaves a little bit like a very classical, um, let's say, pendulum uh, with a little bit more degrees of freedom because it has different eigenmodes. And those can be excited if you, if you shake the system at the right frequency. For the second one, which is these amplifier flows. Uh, here you see a, an example of a flow. The movie doesn't play, but it doesn't matter much. Uh, it's the flow behind a, a backward facing step. So what you see here is a vorticity. So you inject a, a positive flow at the inlet, 
And from this Poiseuille flow, um, the flow separates and creates a very huge recirculation, which will give rise progressively to a vortices. And in that system, you can demonstrate, we'll come back to that. We're going to study it a lot today, this 2D backward phasing step. You can see instabilities only if you excite the system with, uh, with either noise or a specific harmonic forcing. And finally, here on the right, we have a recent example of a self-sustained instability that I will comment a little bit more in detail, which is was uh, was uh, done in collaboration with Arno Berch uh, and and um, Philippe Renault here in the micro uh, mechanical department. So this is a movie that explains a little bit about the system. So what you see here is a system which has two inlets. Uh, everything is steady and quiet. So we inject the fluid from the top, a fluid from the bottom, uh, and of course, there's a laminar state, which you see here, but that loses stability in favor of this, uh, let's say, uh, oscillating jet mode. And depending on the Reynolds number, which is here based on the velocity at the inlet channels, it's equal for both channels. And the uh, dimension of the channels, you get a, an oscillation at a higher and higher frequencies when the Reynolds number increases. So that's a typical situation um, of facing jets, let's call them, which is very typical of many, many systems in fluid mechanics which present self-sustained oscillations. In these situations, the frequency that we observe actually is completely intrinsic. So unless you really force the system with a hammer, I mean, very hard, uh, these systems will actually behave independently of you're trying to, what you're trying to dictate to them. They don't really listen. They, these systems are really uh, self-sustained. And actually the, the response to harmonic forcing, at least in the linear, sense is ill posed because if you want to force the system at a frequency which is too different from its natural frequencies then the system just uh, doesn't listen to your harmonic forcing so th in this present situation of the facing jets we could do a stability analysis and you see some of the results of the stability analysis in there what you see is that this r this is the growth right here sigma and the frequency as divided by the natural frequency of the system for different Reynolds numbers. So each color is a different Reynolds. And what you see is that there's a specific eigenmode at a given frequency, which bifurcates from stable to unstable. So it crosses the axis. And as it becomes unstable, then the systems will uh, set, a, set in a limit cycle. It's, it's just one example of that, uh, but there are actually more. There could be examples um, where you see similar things, uh, like, the, of course, the celebrated uh, uh, von Kármán, Benar von Kármán Vortex Street. Uh, now an example for resonator. So here is just a, a system in which we try to study the dumping behavior of added foam. But if you focus only on the left image, you will see that the system spontaneously decays slowly on an exponential scale, following its natural eigenfrequency. And so that's what I mentioned earlier. If you don't fault the system, it will come back to rest. So it's a very typical uh, example of a mechanical resonator. So sometimes these things are called oscillators, but I want to make them different from the previous ones because if you look at the eigenmodes of this guy, the eigenmodes are all stable. So in these present situations, there are not multiples one from each other. This is because we are not looking at a string or we're not looking at a one-dimensional system. We are looking at a system with a, with a cylindrical symmetry. So the eigenfunctions are Bessel functions and their zeros are not commensurate, which is why the interfrequency between two natural frequencies is not constant, so it's not like a one-dimensional system. But still what's important here is that if you look at the frequency response, here in an ideal case without dissipation, or with little dissipation actually, you see that, very little uh, uh, dissipation, you see that for each of these natural frequencies you have a peak in the transfer function. So that's the uh, ratio of the response with respect to the forcing. And that ratio is very large when you're close to the, to the resonance. We are clearly used to this. But again, if you don't force the system, you let it evolve alone, nothing will happen. And finally, an example of these last systems, which I mentioned. So I will have a couple of problems with my media apparently today. Not sure exactly why, but it's not a big deal. So it's a flow which is a little bit like the backward facing step, but somewhat different. So it's the flow of a boundary layer which climbs on a bump and then doesn't manage to uh, decelerate without creating a very extended recirculation region. And because of this recirculation region, you have the coexistence of a fast flow and a very slow flow uh, with a very intense shear layer. And that shear layer is the ideal, uh, let's say, um, 
ideal base state for the Kevin Hamilton's stability to grow. And if you look at uh, the in presence of, uh, it's just numerical noise here. We didn't even have to force any additional noise. It was done actually in collaboration with uh, Uwe Einstein at that time and Mathieu Marquis, who works uh, also in Lille. And at that time, what we saw is that you have here a very significant um, response here uh, for the flow. And um, it's a broadband response. It has more or less a peak, but it's not exactly like a resonator or an amplificator because it could respond to many, many in a wide frequency band. So that's what we see here for the backward facing step, which we studied in more detail since then. Uh, it's a little bit easier to analyze because the, it's more confined, whereas this flow was uh, 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 not confined, it was semi-confined. There was a boundary layer in the free stream so that on the Y scale, it would create some difficulties. Whereas this one here is entirely bounded by walls. So that simplifies a little bit the numerical simulation. Simulations and calculations are all done here in finite elements, but I will not today discuss uh, any of the numerical details. And so what we see in this case, we can first compute the spectrum of that flow, which you see here on the bottom picture. You see that there are a couple of um, almost unstable static modes, but they're all stable. And there's nothing dynamic here. I mean, all the, the dynamic modes, all the modes with non-zero frequency are largely very, very dense. And interestingly, if you look at the response curve, so that's a, just a transfer function. So you, you just put an, a harmonic noise at the inlet and you look after uh, vanishing of the transient, um, of the transients, you look at this uh, steady state or let's say permanent response and you measure the intensity uh, of the response. It's very, very large at frequencies for which nothing happens in terms of spectrum. You don't see here at that maximum amplification, amplified frequency, any special eigenvalue corresponding. So it's extremely different than classical resonators because the response takes place at a frequency for which there's no special eigen mode, which, which is outlined by the system. So these systems um, are those we want to study today. So today, the focus will really be on this, what I call amplifiers. So the terminology, of course, is, is, is always a very challenging uh, thing because, uh, I mean, of course, this is also an amplifier. And this is also, uh, if you want, an oscillator. And this is also an oscillator, et cetera, et cetera. So here, I'm just trying to use a terminology which I find helps distinguishing uh, this different type of flows. But of course, it has nothing gen generic. And I don't pretend that it should be the terminology that everybody has to uh, has to follow but for me it helps it helps me uh, to to use these three categories so again we have the resonators they have weakly damped natural frequencies and so they respond to harmonic noise or harmonic excitation if the frequency of the harmonic excitation is close to a natural frequency of the system we have systems which have unstable eigenvalues in that case they uh, spontaneously uh, grow the perturbations until they reach a limit cycle, which would be periodic in general. And we have this category of amplifiers, which can respond to a broadband range of frequencies. And we are we want to develop weekly nonlinear methods for these amplifiers. And for that, here's the structure I want to follow today. So in this structure, I will have this introduction, which I went through. Then we'll have try to convince you that the reason why we have these broadband responses is a consequence of the so-called non-normality of the linear operator governing the perturbations in the situations. Then I will discuss about methods which exi exist already and are well established for resonators and oscillators to discuss the effect of weak nonlinearity. And then I will try to discuss the combination of weak nonlinearity for strong non-normality, where we had to develop novel tools to uh, do that uh, because of the lack of outstanding or yeah outstanding eigenvalue. And then I will conclude. So let me start with this. So non-normality has been um, understood in the mid-90s for fluid mechanics uh, by Trefethen, Farrell, and Yonu, Schmidt, and Hanson, and many others. And so it, 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 it's a very general principle for linear operators, but it's very frequent actually in hydrodynamics because it will take place, non-normality, when the operator is not normal. So what means for an operator to be normal? If an operator, an operator is normal, if it commutes with its adjoint. So for that, I first need maybe to define what is an adjoint operator. So the adjoint operator for simple scalar products, let's say Cartesian scalar products, 
is simply the transpose of the of the matrix, the transpose of the if the matrix has if the operator has been discretized. But more generally, you can define it if you use a scalar product, and you get the adjoint equation which defines uh, the adjoint operator simply by switching um, the vector on which the operator operates. But for us, it's sufficient to think of it as a transpose for today. And so if L is not normal, so if it doesn't commute with its adjoint, then a lot of things can happen. The dumping rates of the eigenvalues do not say everything about the dynamics, okay? So you cannot understand the dynamics if you look only at the spectral properties. So by spectral properties, I mean eigenvalues, eigenfunctions. Actually, a lot of the other things can happen. First of all, the eigenvalues and their and the eigenfrequencies, so the yeah, the eigenmodes, are extremely sensitive to small operator perturbations. So that's very bad news for numerics because when you do numerics and you want to compute the eigenvalues of a flow, very often you cannot do it analytically and you need to resort to linearize to the to, to the computation, the numerical computation of the spectrum based on the uh, Navier-Stokes linearized Navier-Stokes operator. And that of course goes with discretization errors that you cannot avoid whatever method you use. And so the consequence of this discretization error can be huge precisely because you have a strong sensitivity to small parameters. So that's the that's these uh, gray uh, point three. Then the two points which are relevant for us today, a system which is not normal can be can have very significant and important trends in growth. And it can show very strong response to harmonic forcing away from eigenfrequencies. So why is that where is that coming from? It comes from the very uh, it can be very quickly understood. So you have here a very simple uh, generic linear system. This linear system has an initial condition. Um, if L is time independent, I can compute actually the response at any time by using this matrix exponential, which is just nothing else than an operator. And so if I want to know at time t, uh, what is the maximum amplitude of the response Q, I can try to maximize this uh, ratio of norm. And these ratios of norm is nothing more actually than the two norm of the operator itself. So it's the, it's the definition of the two norm of the matrix exponential of TL. And here you, 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 can, you have two examples. You have the examples of the B case, B matrix here. It's very simple, right? It's a very classical example, which has been given by Schmidt and Henningsen, where for that B matrix, which is not normal, so it doesn't commute with its adjoint, you can launch a special initial condition which contains a little bit of E1, which is one of the eigenvectors, and a bit of E2, which is the other eigenvector, and composes to this X here initial condition. And progressively, of course, each of the components on E1 is going to get reduced by its exponential decay, minus 1 and minus 2, respectively. So along E1, it's going to decay E to the minus T. Along E2, it's going to decay E to the minus 2T. But altogether, you will still explore a little bit of transient growth, which you see here in the norm of X. And that's a consequence of the non-orthogonality of the two eigenmodes. Now, A is a normal matrix. It commutes with its adjoint. Because of that, it has eigenmodes, eigenfunctions, which are mutually orthogonal. So E1 and E2 are orthogonal. And because of that, you can only decay. So in that situation, you have to have monotonous decay. So the possibility of having non-monotonous decay results from the non-normality of the operator. Now, for fluids, you see it here, and it has been done for the backward facing step by Blackburn and others in 2008. And they found out that if you kick the, the system with that initial condition, it's a bit of a weird initial condition, but it's not forbidden. You will, after exponential of TL, so after T here equal to 58, get a structure which looks like that with, be careful, things being completely differently normalized. So the color here shouldn't be uh, compared to the color there because the difference in amplitude is in the order of 10 to the 4. So here you have much more, uh, let's say, uh, energy if you compute the velocity square and you integrate it. So it's the kinetic energy of the perturbation than what, than what you have as initial condition. So you give one as initial condition, it's a linear problem. So if you give one, you get, you get 6, 10 to the 4 out of it, if you, et cetera, et cetera. So that's a purely linear concept, but it's extremely impressive the amount of amplification you can get. And this is the consequence of the Kevin Hamilton stability along the shear layer. The second uh, manifestation of the normality is in the harmonic response. So here I take that system, I force it harmonically at frequency omega naught, and I look at this, the, the permanent response, forgetting about the transient, 
And I do that by look by using that ansatz, so looking for a response at the very same frequency because it's a linear system. In order to find the response, I just have to inverse that operator here, which is called the resolvent. I mean, the, re the resolvent is this inverse operator. So the resolvent maps a forcing to a response. And for the bad work, back, and so you can again try to maximize the norm of that operator, which is the norm of the response when compared to the forcing. And um, this norm can be very large, so it can be written as the inverse of a small number, epsilon naught. I'll come back to that. And so that's what happens here. You start with a forcing, so that's not an initial condition. It's the forcing of the right hand side of this linear Navier Stokes dynamics. So it should not be seen as an initial condition. It's not velocity, it's a, it's a, it's a body force. That body force will be permanently sustained with, a, with an amplitude one um, in time with a frequency omega naught. And after a certain transient, it will give rise to this permanent state at omega naught, permanent response oscillating at omega naught, but with an amplitude which is one over epsilon larger. So it's really, uh, again, a significant gain. And the curve is here. So for frequency non-dimensional in some way of 0 0.08, the exact details don't matter, but there is a frequency for which you get a gain of seven or 8,000. It's a significant response for a weak uh, excitation. Okay, so two coins, two sides of the same coin. Transient growth here, Blackburn's paper in 2008, and we and many others actually on this sort of uh, backward facing steps and, and other uh, flows with long elongated shear layers uh, with very strong harmonic response. Okay, so two, again, two coins of the, two sides of the same coin. Now the question I want to ask today is what happens when I'm starting putting a little bit of nonlinear terms in there, okay? So what happens when I add uh, nonlinear terms? Because in general, this is just a linear principle here. We see a huge non-normal growth again, away from the least damped eigenvalues. And here we see a transient growth. Now, imagine that I'm changing the initial amplitude. So a lot of things can happen. You can have, for instance, saturation mechanisms. So because of nonlinear saturation, you will have less amplification, so less response, at least in terms of gain, if I do the ratio of the response with respect to the initial forcing. If I increase the initial the amplitude of the of the forcing, I will possibly get less uh, response. So in which case the nonlinearities will be saturating, or maybe I will have more. In which case the nonlinearities are desaturating. And same for transient growth. I may have a saturation effect like in green here, or I may have a desaturating effect. I may have a sort of mechanism which is sometimes called bypass transition mechanism towards subcritical transition towards another bifurcated state. So actually, I could. People have thought of transient growth as one of the possible building blocks, building blocks to explain subcritical transition in many shear flows. Okay, you can very well imagine that you have uh, uh, you initially use a linear phase of the growth, which is then subsequently lift. I mean, or hey, uh, yeah, which is taken over by a nonlinear subcritical mechanism, which brings you away from that um, uh, from 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 that uh, reference state, and so. What we want to study today is we want to come up with tools that can predict the effect of a small nonlinearity. So we want to use small initial conditions or small forcings for which nonlinearity start to enter the game, and we want to try to be pre to be able to predict what these what they do to the system. And it turns out that there's a huge and beautiful body of literature on the effect of weak nonlinearity in resonators and oscillators. So people know for more than 50 years that uh, when you are dealing with a resonator or an oscillator with a near neutral eigenmode, that's the key component, you can come up with different numerical, different theoretical methods to predict the effect of nonlinearity. And among these classical test cases, there is the celebrated Benar von Kamen street, which you see here. So you see here the flow around the cylinder in 2D, it's of course you, you are probably fed up with that example, but it's kind of a good example still. Uh, if you are below 47 roughly, then you see a laminar flow, a steady, not only laminar, but steady and um, yeah, and uh, symmetric top down. If you go above 47 here, for instance, 140, you will have an alternated vortex street um, with, uh, yeah, with, uh, which breaks the time symmetry uh, or time invariance, and it breaks also the top down symmetry. Now, you can, you can uh, explain that 
by first of all uh, running uh, by first of all computing the spectrum of this flow uh, by linearizing the Navier-Stokes equation. So here you recognize the linearized Navier-Stokes equations around a base state which I call capital U. Capital U is going to be this time independent state, and I can linearize around it, and I can introduce a normal mode, and that's with an eigenvalue here lambda, and I can compute. Uh, these lambdas, or at least a set of them, because there are as many as degrees of freedom, so that's maybe a bit too many, but there are methods, of course, around to focus on those who are the least damped. And doing so, I will find which is one which is unstable above 47, and so I will see in my, if I run a simulation with that initial con eigen mode as initial condition, I will see things growing, growing, growing exponentially, that's a log time plot from that base state with that natural unstable mode and associated Reynolds stresses, Run stress as being the mean value of u uh, prime dot u prime, or grad u prime u prime. Okay, like in, in turbulence uh, theory. And at, at some point, the flow will saturate. So you will saturate in the limit cycle, and that's the way the limit cycle looks like. This is the fluctuation, this is the mean state. It has changed massively with respect to the initial condition, which was base flow. So at Reynolds 100 here, which is above 47, you see that the base state, which is the steady solution of the Navier-Stokes equations and the mean state from an unsteady GNS sitting on its limit cycle are different. And you see also that the natural frequency of the limit cycle is very different from its initial frequency when it was still in the growing phase. So the eigen mode has an eigen value with a frequency which is 0.74 here, but at saturation it becomes 1.3. The frequency has changed massively. Okay, that's what you can see here. It's troll number as a function of Reynolds from uh, old papers of Williamson, Peer, and many others. And so what you see here is that the base state, which has very long recirculation region is unstable, is very different from the mean state uh, along the limit cycle. And also the frequency that you would predict from a stability analysis of this is very different from the frequency uh, that you can measure in these experiments. And the reason of this is a sort of uh, mean flow distortion, it's often called. There's a lot of work on that by people, uh, including Vesfred, uh, ESPCI group, Marcos very early on, uh, Farad and Yonu, Noak, many, many people. So the idea is that the flow by itself generates nonlinearities, and those nonlinearities operate a little bit like a, like a governor or a regulator. So it's like a little bit the system by itself, by its nonlinearities, would close the loop to mitigate the further growth of the instabilities, and still you reach some sort of uh, balanced state, or let's say self sustained, or maybe self-consistent state. And so a good analogy, where of course you have to drive that by, by, by a closed loop that you had to design yourself, is maybe the watch regulator, which was used to reduce the, um, the fuel, or not the fuel, but the oxygen uh, uh, support, up the oxygen flux in an engine. So if the engine was starting to rotate too fast, then these balls, because of centrifugal force, would uh, go a little bit further apart, which would progressively close this throttle. And that would, of course, close the uh, uh, admission of, of, of oxygen and reduce the combustion until it reaches a steady state. And so it seems that this sort of flows spontaneously have such of a closing loop mechanism that seems to be self-stabilizing. Okay, if you want to study that vertically, one very good way to do that is to write down a stuart lando amplitude equation. And so a stuart lando uh, amplitude equation is an equation that governs not the details of that history here, but the details of the envelope of that of that uh, of that um, uh, trajectory of that history. So the envelope is just the the, the prefactor that multiplies an oscillating uh, perturbation. And so you can write the following equation for the envelope. You can write that its dynamic its time dynamics is governed by uh, a, a number here, which is a small number, which is the growth rate. So it could be either positive above, above criticality or negative below criticality or zero exactly at criticality. And then what you have here is a so-called Lando constant, which is gonna tell you about the nonlinear effects. If it's positive, these are stabilizing effects, so saturating effects. If it's negative, desaturating. Okay, so let me hurry up a little bit. This is very classical. It predicts saturation, depending on the real part of mu r and lambda r above thresholds, it predicts saturation. And it predicts also a nonlinear frequency correction, which is quadratic in the amplitude that we just computed. So these two ingredients are very uh, consistent with observations, experimental observations. The way to compute these lambda and mu 
is a bit challenging. So lambda is a, is coming from a linear problem. So it's actually the growth rate of the. It's nothing else than the than the eigenvalue itself. Okay, it's the growth rate, uh, which is tiny of the eigenvalue as you as you vary the Reynolds number, and this is computed by the so-called multiple scale approach. So the idea is that you have to expand uh, the flow around its its nominal uh, state, base state at critical Reynolds forty seven. Then you add a little perturbation, a perturbation square cube, etc., and you also scale a slow time by epsilon square. And epsilon is the departure; it's the size of this perturbation, okay? And it's also the departure from criticality. So criticality is at Reynolds star, and one over Reynolds minus one over Reynolds critical, critical tells you how far you are from threshold. And you decide that this is epsilon square. The slow time is also epsilon square, and the perturbation itself is epsilon. And you, then you solve at each order. That's called the multiple scale method, invented by Stuart and used for the cylinder first by Sip and Lebedev. So you start from Q0, which we computed earlier. So that's Q0, okay? But at this 47 point, this is Q0. Then you compute the Q1, which we did earlier. So you compute a cri at criticality, the eigenvalue is purely imaginary. So it's purely oscillating. It doesn't have any growth rate. It doesn't have any decay rate. You have an eigenstate, it's a function, and then you have an amplitude, which is a node. So you do as if T, capital T, and little t are decoupled. That's why it's called multiple scale. And therefore, you still have an envelope which evolves on a slow time scale. You go at next order, you can solve the problem at next order. You will have three components, so and square, you will have three components. One which results from the fact that you are not exactly at the critical Reynolds number anymore, because this tells you you are, you are at a slightly different Reynolds number than critical. There's also a part which, co which corresponds to what I mentioned earlier, what the Reynolds stresses do to the mean flow. And there's also a harmonic response at two omega because of non they generate harmonics. So that's clean. Now you go at order three and then you have a problem because at order three, you retrieve a linear operator, which is singular at the frequency omega star because it has as an value I omega star. But you force it by a term which is exactly at omega star. So it's like you take a system which is exactly neutral at a certain frequency and you excite it at its natural frequency. This will create a secular term, a term that grows indefinitely, linearly in time forever. And that should be avoided. If you avoid that, you require that the F3 forcing term here, which is made of that, these three contributions, so slow time evolution, this term and this term, you require that this is uh, in the kernel of the adjoint. It's called the Fredholm alternative. So it's a little bit like a non-resonance or non-secularity condition. And you arrive to that with lambda mu being pre-computed, being computed from simple calculations involving this, which has been computed knowing first order problems and second order problems, which you solved a priori. And you need a so-called adjoint field. I mentioned already the adjoint, so we know now what's an adjoint. And from that, we can compute everything. And it works pretty well, I mean, with a restricted domain of validity, but you see here for the frequency as a function of the Reynolds number for the for the uh, von Karman Benar vortex street, you see here that the green line is the prediction from the weak nonlinear theory, and it's already much better than the linear stability on the base flow, which is, is um, a red curve. Okay, so we have a method, and that method works super well also for what I called earlier resonators. It has been applied at extensively to the problem of sloshing. So here you see a recent example from a recent paper by Bauerlein and Avila. We have been doing it in the lab too. So you see here uh, what happens, uh, you, 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 you do the weakly nonlinear approximation of this resonating flow. You arrive to something which looks very much like a nonlinear um, spring stiffening duffing oscillator which is a very classical mechanical system. And so instead of having a resonance which is centered, it's, it starts being uh, showing a bit of hysteresis uh, with two possible stable state in some domain. And, and you see here experiments and weakly non a theory perfectly fit. Okay, so why does that work? In both circumstances, what makes the method work, you need a neutral operator. You need an operator which has a kernel. You need an operator which has a zero growth rate, which, which doesn't evolve in time. If not, you cannot do the, the multiple scale analysis. And so it, here it works because you have one eigenvalue, which is exactly neutral at 46.6 or 47. 
depending on your grid. And here it works because this eigen mode is damped, but it's only very weakly damped. And so you can assume that this damping is small and you can do as if it was zero and restore it into the, 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 the weakly nonlinear approximation method. How can we do that for our problem? Our problem doesn't have an out, uh, doesn't have a neutral eigenvalue of relevance. We know that our system does care about a frequency in the order of 0.5 once made non-dimensional in this way here. And we know that there is not a single eigenvalue to do anything here. So how can we try to use an analogous method to multiple scale in a system where we don't have what's called very often a central manifold? Because having an eigenvalue which is neutral defines a, a, a region of the state space in which the processes are slow. Processes are slow because the, the grow, I mean the growing rate or dumping rate is exactly zero or very close to zero. So that means that you relax slowly or you get away from a state slowly. And here we don't have anything slow because all these dumping rates are, 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 are large. And there is not a single structure that we can operate with. So we don't, we, it's very difficult to come up with a scalar equation pre-multiplied by a structure because we don't know what structure to use. So that's why we had to work pretty hard with Yves-Marie and Edouard to come up with a method, which I call here the odd alliance. So the idea is to try to, to braid weak nonlinearity with strong nonlinearity. Okay? And we start with harmonic, for, harmonic forcing. And given the time I took already to, to explain all of this, I think I will probably stick to the harmonic forcing configuration, which is, which is uh, sufficient to understand the idea. So we're gonna start from that. So we know these are examples of direct numerical simulations. Well, we force at that scroll here, Reynolds is 500. And we see that the response at small amplitude of forcing is this, but it's, it's completely different at another amplitude of forcing. And so the gain is extremely different. The ratio of that divided by that is much larger than the ratio of that divided by that. And we can see it here. So linearly, we expect a gain in the order of 7,000. Very quickly, when epsilon grows, the, the gain is, is getting less and less and less. You see, it's very spectacular saturation mechanisms here. And it comes with the following, uh, I mean, very strong modifications of the flow. So now um, you can repeat that at different frequencies. So when you look here, uh, the linear curve is the green curve. And now you force with an optimal structure at each different frequency. And now you change, so I called it earlier epsilon here, it's called A, you change the forcing amplitude. The response, the gain of the response strongly, strongly saturates whatever the frequency. So we feel like we should be able to describe that with an amplitude equation. And here's the way it works. We start from what we understood earlier in the linear framework. We understood in the linear framework that there was an operator called the resolvent, which was mapping F forcing into a response. And if I make the optimal forcing unitary, the vector itself, and the response unitary, I can rewrite that in the following form. The inverse resolvent, so the one which takes the response, maps it back onto the forcing with a prefactor, which is tiny, the inverse gain. So the gain is huge, which means the inverse gain is small. So it means that that operator, the inverse resolvent, is almost singular because it can almost eat a vector here and brings it to zero because that number is small, so it's almost zero. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna perturb my inverse resolvent a little bit such that this new operator, which is written it here, so it's the inverse resolvent minus epsilon minus a small quantity built by the uh, optimal uh, forcing and um, the dot product was the response. Okay, so it's like a projector. So I'm correcting my inverse resolvent by that little addition of a, of a projector, and that eats U naught and brings it back to zero. So this means that this new operator, which I will call phi, which is again a corrected inverse resolvent by a small projector, by the addition of a small number times the projector, this thing here is actually singular. And we can see it here. So these are the eigenvalues in blue that we saw earlier for just the operator itself. Now, 
if I do the following operator correction, I manage to create a neutral eigenvalue. And it's exactly at the frequency at which I constructed the resolvent. So for each frequency, I can correct with this quantity here, plus the inverse gain, which itself depends on the frequency. And I get for every single frequency, a novel operator, which is exactly singular. And its side joint is also exactly singular. And it's, it's, it's nice because the operator itself eats the response and gives zero, and the adjoint operator eats the forcing and gives zero, okay? And you can see, so it's a very, very tiny uh, perturbation of the operator. And so since it's tiny, we can incorporate it into the multiple scale expansion. So except that we use slightly different notations in square root of epsilon instead of epsilon, but that's exactly like what I did earlier. We can assume the following ansatz. We take a base state, <clears throat> we had a little bit of a fluctuation, a perturbation with size square root of epsilon zero, second order, third order, exactly like before. We have to hear this convective operator, which just for ease of notation, and we inject into the linearized, I mean, not linearized, but into the Navier-Stokes equations. At square root of epsilon order, we get the linear dynamics. At next order, we get the uh, effect of the Reynolds stresses, et cetera, et cetera. We're used to that. Now, we inject into this a decomposition which is made of a, of a, uh, of a flow working at the harmonic uh, frequencies and its multiples, plus something which is steady. So that's going to be the mean flow distortion, and that's going to be the harmonic response and subsequent harmonics. You inject that, and you Fourier transform, and you arrive to the following problem. You arrive to a problem at square root of epsilon zero, which is the resolvent problem that we had earlier. Same at second order, same at third order, et cetera, et cetera. And now what you will do is you will perturb the, or the operator i omega zero minus l here by the operation, by the projector we mentioned here. So you add and subtract a perturbation and you get to the following problem. You arrive to, uh, at square root of epsilon zero, a single operator and subsequent uh, orders, and because you had to add and subtract the perturbation, you retrieve it here at order uh, three, okay? So that, that's kind of, uh, of nice, because now I can crank up the, the, the machine. I mean, there's no difficulty. At first order, I find nothing very surprising. I find that I have a single operator. So U11 should be in the kernel. So it means it should behave like the response multiplied by an unknown amplitude varying over a small time scale and at the, at the forcing frequency. So that's clear. At the next order, I can find that I have a steady base state correction, I mean, mean flow correction and a second harmonic, no problem. And at third order, I have now this single operator, which is fed by a resonant term. I need to make sure that the right hand side here doesn't saturate. I mean, doesn't, doesn't excite the system, which is already neutral. So I have to apply Fredholm alternative. I have to avoid uh, a, a secular growth. I do that by asking that the right-hand side of that equation is in the kernel of the adjoint, and it, it gives me a rise to the following equation. It's a Landau-like equation with a linear term, a time evolution, a non-error correction term, and a forcing term, because it's a forced Landau equation, because I have a forcing here, which results actually from the small perturbation um, which results from the fact that I have a little bit false forcing, which I didn't mention earlier. I force only very little, so it's only at order three that I force here. And if I do that, so I arrive to this beautiful equation, which is exactly the same type of equation you get from a Duffing, from a Duffing oscillator if you do multiple scale, but you have only one mode, which is weakly damped, which is not our case here. But you can arrive to the same thing for an amplitude, but the amplitude multiplies the response, optimal response to harmonic forcing. And each of these coefficients can be easily computed from uh, scalar products, okay? So that's the main result I wanted to share with you. We have a stuart landau like equation, which contains the forcing intensity. It's, it's a scalar because it, I mean, it's all a one number because it multiplies a scaling, which is uh, epsilon to the cube. It contains a term here, which is order one, which is coming from the gain itself, a slow time evolution and uh, a saturating or desaturating term. And so at steady state, you can find a solution to that. 
if the full thing is very tiny, these two terms will dominate, and then you will have just the linear response. When the full thing becomes large, this becomes important. And so that's what we can compute here for different Reynolds numbers. Each color is a different Reynolds number. We see how the gain pre-multiplied by, um, yes, the, the linear gain uh, var saturates when we progressively increase the full thing. And these, uh, this saturation is pretty sp spectacular. So very quickly, the full thing the, the response saturates, and this is predicted by that, by that Landau-like equation. And we can repeat that for different frequencies. And so here you compare the curves, which are done with this simple model here, just a scalar model, scalar amplitude equation, with the diamonds which are extracted from DNS simulations, or direct numerical simulations in which we excite the system with increasing amplitude, and we look at the steady or the permanent response. And we see that the agreement is not perfect, quantitatively, but qualitatively, at least at small forcing, it works extremely well. Okay, I finish with a desaturating case. So here we're gonna do the same, okay, for the OR effect. So the OR effect is a situation for, is a, is a classical non-normal mechanism for a Poiseuille flow. So you take the flow between two plates. It's parabolic, of course, it's not a surprise. And you can do an optimal forcing, which looks a bit like this at a frequency, which is this for runs number 3000, which is below the the value at which these uh, plane poison flow becomes unstable, and you get an optimal response out of that, okay? And um, the gain is not stratospheric, it's not gigantic, but it's in, it's in terms, if you look at the gain in terms of energy, it's in the order of a few hundreds. So that's sufficient to proceed with that, uh, because the conditions, of course, to, to do these things is to have a, a, a huge gain. So it's sufficient to proceed to that method, okay? And in that case, there was an outstanding eigenvalue, which was actually not very far from the resonance. So this is in a situation in which we have the consideration of a weakly damped an, uh, eigenvalue on the top of a, of a, of a, of a non-normal mechanism. Because you see that if, if only the eigenvalue was important, then we would force exactly with the structure of the eigenvalue itself. And that's not what we do. We force with something which is different from what we get out of the system. So that shows that non-normality is important here. Okay, which, so here I have a slight problem in my slides. Uh, let me check if I can get better slides for that. I don't know what happened, or I know what I will do. I will just close. It's not going to be too long. Um, I have too many things open, I think. And I will reopen it and hopefully it's gonna work. Let me try maybe this one. It's a form presentation which has the right slides and see if I have it. Yes, I have it. So I was the right. Uh, okay. Well, no. No, either. <laughs> Don't laugh. It has been a long day. Um, I wanted to show you this thing. Okay. So that's what I explained. Now. If you look at the responses from these weekly nonlinear equation, it's interesting because actually the nonlinear term has a negative real part, this mu here. And so that means that it's a desaturating, at least for a certain range of frequencies, it's a desaturating nonlinearity. And it means that if you start from small amplitude, you will be a little bit like linear. If you increase the amplitude, you can get more gain than predicted by linear. And you can even create what's called islands of solutions like we see here. And this is interesting because we expect that these will have manifestation uh, in terms of linear uh, of, of response, okay? So in particular, there, is, there can be a region which is highlighted between the two dashed lines for the, let's say the second color here. You see the, the color I'm pointing here. So it's mid red, let's, let's call it. 
for the mid-red forcing amplitude, there's a region in which there's no steady solution to that problem. So that means that if there is no steady solution to that problem, it means the system cannot settle at the frequency of forcing into something regular. And that's exactly what we see in DNS. We launch direct number simulations with that forcing amplitude. And what do we see? We see that suddenly, as we increase the forcing amplitude, we land on a state which is chaotic, complicated, and different from regular. And that's exactly predicted by that um, by that theory. So even in cases of desaturating nonlinearities, we cannot, co of course, we are very far from our base state, so it probably doesn't make sense to, you know, to try to get more information from this amplitude equation. But the amplitude equation reveals the loss of a simple solution, and that's compatible with DNS. So we learned a lot from this weekly nonlinear analysis that the system would become complicated. From linear analysis, you couldn't deduce any of this, okay? So with that, I want to stop, and I show you the conclusions because it would be a bit too long. So in non-normal systems, the inverse resolvent, and actually you can repeat that exercise for the so-called inverse propagator, are almost neutral. And because they they create a notable mediation of the response and that are close to singular. Therefore, we can perturb them with a small perturbation to make their kernel uh, non-empty. Because of that, we can proceed to a multiple scale expansion and we can arrive to a beautiful harmonic for, for harmonic force and a beautiful Stuart Landau like equation where A is the amplitude that pre multiplies the optimal response. I very much thank you for your for your attention, and I'm ready to take any question. So thank you very much, uh, Francois, for for the uh, very detailed and interesting presentation. So as you said, uh, we can open the stage for questions. So whoever wants to ask a question, please feel free to unmute your mic or write in the chat, and I can report it. Um, So okay, maybe I can uh, I can start with one. Uh, so uh, actually, uh, I have a question regarding uh, the very last thing you you showed yeah. uh, on the uh, yes 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 exactly this this uh, uh, aspect here. So um, uh, actually, I have it's it's two questions in one the first question is uh, can uh, this weekly nonlinear uh, analysis uh, somehow tell us something about the the um, um, uh, the dynamics of the system intended as attracting and uh, repelling manifold of, a, of 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 the actual system like if we consider um, strange attractors for example I, at least I wouldn't say that the system um, has only um, two degrees of freedom in the end, because mm -hmm. it's A, which is a complex number. I so see. with a single mode, such of a scalar equation, I don't think can predict anything like chaos. Okay. But what it can still predict is that it predicts the absence you see here in this region between the two dashed line vertical lines. It predicts the absence of any solution to that problem, steady. So it doesn't tell us that the system will become chaotic, but it tells us that the system has to become something different. We don't know why, because with the level of refinement that we have, um, it's I mean the level of description. Remember that we describe the flow just as the product of a scalar amplitude times a structure which is governed from pure linear analysis. So it's difficult to expect more in a sense uh, mm -hmm. than a message of problems. We know a problem happens, but still saying more about that problem is really difficult. But what we can say is that depending on the sign of these nonlinear coefficient here, either we expect a saturation situation, okay, like we see here mm -hmm. when we force at low frequency, everything is clean. The more I force, the more intense I force, yes. the less I respond, okay, that's saturating. Mm -hmm. Or desaturating and sometimes desaturating to a level that I lose the existence of a solution. And if I lose the existence of a solution, I, I can anticipate that something will happen. If I want to describe that something, 
then I need to do fully nonlinear calculations of maybe orbits, periodic orbits or whatever. I need to get a little bit more of information about the system in the spirit of what uh, a lot of people do, like maybe um, Johan Duguay or maybe Tobias Schneider or at KTH, uh, Dan Henningsen or many others. Uh, so trying to get a little bit more about the unstable orbits of such systems to try to maybe better understand the nature of these sort of chaotic uh, or semi-chaotic because it's not completely chaotic excursions. I see, and that's that's basically what uh, uh, you you actually anticipate. The second part of the of the question that was about uh, can this uh, weekly uh, nonlinear analysis somehow uh, tell us something about uh, um, a potential good initial forcing for uh, studying the edge state? So basically, <laughs> apparently, yeah, yeah. yes. So that's a very, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I don't know. It's it's a very difficult question because it's the, all this question about minimal seats. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. the question about minimal seat is, um, so I can easily compute an optimal linear uh, condition for a transient growth problem in the linear world. I can also optimize uh, in the non-linear world, but then my question is what to optimize for. Yeah. And so if I start optimizing for maximum energy, then I can find the perturbation which maximizes energy at a certain time. But in order to find the initial condition, which will be on a sort of pattern of attraction and, and, leaves, and leads me away from the edge state mm -hmm. or across the edge state, uh, it's difficult because I don't know over which time to optimize and I don't know um, for what norm I should optimize for. And so we will have the same problems here. Sure. So we can do a weekly nonlinear equation for transient growth, and that's what we did. It's mm -hmm. uh, it's written here, so it's yeah. less a little bit as explicit. We need to first compute a mu two tilde. From that, we compute a mu two, and from this mu two, we can find an equation for a. But uh, I mean, it's just it's more complicated to write. But in terms of imp implementation, it's pretty easy. Mm -hmm. Now, from that, we will have an idea of what happens to a. So yeah. we will see if, for instance, nonlinearities are destabilizing or stabilizing. And we may actually predict situations in which nonlinearities are destabilizing. And even this equation can even lose solution under some circumstances. And that could be an indicator that we are may, we are in a region where probably an edge is not very far. Or at least mm -hmm. something could help, could drive me away from where I am. But it will not tell me precisely where I go. Sure. So that's always this, in, but in general, even in the Caswell and Cherubini uh, work, the minimal seed problem is always a little bit tricky because you still optimize for something and at a certain time, and you are a little bit unsure if this is going to really get you the minimal seed, strictly speaking, which would be the minimal initial condition for which you, you depart definitely from your uh, initial state. So we have similar problems, uh, but we can also set up a uh, an optimization scheme uh, for the system, we can simultan we can try to optimize for a, mm -hmm. and optimize from the initial condition together for the product a times initial condition. Sure. And try to get a, a sort of part in in the in the minimal seed algorithm, we replace some of the uh, estimations by laws governing a instead of governing the full dynamics. So it could be computationally interesting, for instance. I see. But it remains bounded to what happens close to the reference state. Sure, sure, sure. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I see that there is a question. So, uh, Alan, please go ahead. Unmute your mic. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, uh, my question concerns uh, the role of uh, boundary conditions. Uh, it's it, it's not, um, it's not completely clear to me. Uh, you know, once you perfect example, glad you brought that one up. Uh, you know, you uh, obviously uh, the uh, phenomenology you're seeing uh, relates both to the shape of the bounding surfaces. And although you didn't bring this up, there's probably some interesting dependence on whether you use a Dirichlet or Neumann uh, boundary condition, in other words, like free slip and so on. And so I just didn't catch. The, uh, the detail of the connection of uh, since uh, your uh, analyses of the uh, uh, of the bifurcations and the uh, you know, uh, and the instabilities 
uh, are just of a sort of a general nature, focusing on the equation of motion with, uh, you know, you know and, and not saying much within the analysis about the detail the boundary yeah. condition. I didn't yeah. catch exactly how much of your results is sort of a diagnosis of DNS and interpretation of it versus prediction, uh, yeah. you know, from the analysis. So in the, in these uh, type of curves, you see here the, the, the for instance here on the right hand side the DNS are the are, are the are the diamonds, and the prediction from the analysis which has the amplitude equation still on the slide here, are the continuous curves. Okay. So here we just compare yeah uh, two methods uh, one which is this weakly nonlinear method in continuous curve, and the other one which is the DNS both share the very same boundary conditions. The only difference, I mean, in that condition here, perturbation is zero. Uh, on all the walls, uh, of course, it's no slip in that case. And the only difference between what's done in the linear setting or weakly nonlinear setting and DNS is the outlet condition. So the outlet condition um, for the for the in the time dependent DNS uh, is a sort of uh, advection condition condition, let's say. Uh, whereas in the uh, eigenvalue calculations, it's a Neumann. So there is a slight difference, but actually the 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 the, the picture here is a little bit misleading. The outlet condition was put much further downstream. Here it's too close to the dynamics; it would affect the dynamics significantly. But we put it far enough so that it's not so important anymore, and so that we can uh, treat it differently um, in the. Uh, linearized or weakly nonlinear framework and in the DNS framework. And so how did the, you handle the uh, domain boundaries for the case of the uh, uh, the vortex street over the cylinder? Yeah. You have to... So for the vortex street across the cylinder, we have to, we follow a little bit the, um, uh, yeah, the, the, the results of uh, Janetti and Lucchini and others. So let's say the domain is such that it has a little bit of a region uh, up front, but this doesn't have to be too long. It has to be long enough for the adjoint calculation. Uh, the outlet is, is, is in Neumann here. Uh, sometimes we can use a sponge region. Here we put the Neumann uh, reasonably far, so it's not a big deal. And one difficulty is the uh, lateral boundary conditions. And actually, this number, which I mentioned here, 47, turns to be out to be. So here it's a no shear boundary condition at a certain distance. It's not a no slip, it's a no shear. So no stress. Um, this this boundary can, the system is a little bit sensitive to that. And so the 47 will a little bit depend how far you put your lateral uh, domain boundaries. So I in, in the talk I did today, I always incorporated the linearized dynamics uh, for Navier-Stokes, and that included the boundary conditions. But now, if you want to look in details, then you need to be very careful because the adjoint problem doesn't have exactly the same boundary conditions than the direct problem, so you need to be a bit careful on the way you do that. These are very, very good questions. Okay, thank you. So, thank you. So, um... Uh, I see Tappan who has a question, then uh, Satya. Yeah. yeah. Uh, am I audible? Yes, sure. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Thank you for the you know wonderful uh, presentation. Now I have two questions in slide number forty-six. You have a singular value decomposition for uh, what you call the uh, resolvent operator. Yes. R omega naught. So, what exactly the singular value, you know, uh, tell us to this uh, analysis over here? So, that's a very valid point. So, the singular value uh, decomposition helps one to identify the optimal. Um, so, to to find the u naught and f naught, which make, which saturate the norm of that operator. Okay, yeah. So, so the U naught and the F naught are obtained from an SVD. Actually, the two norm of an operator is obtained from an SVD, and the largest SVD will be the optimal gain, and its left uh, singular value will be the optimal forcing, and right singular value will be the optimal response. Yeah. So, another question is that you also mentioned about the Fredholm uh, alternatives, right? Yes. And uh, around 
slide number 58 or yeah, so. Yeah. 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 So what exactly, like, uh, how do you uh, apply that freedom alternative for your, I know that you want to find out the kernel operator whose kernel is zero, right? Yeah. So you see here in that, in that third equation, you have a yeah. single operator phi, which has a mm -hmm. kernel. And yes. You, and you need to look for u three three one such that um, such that it can it can um, respond to the right hand side. The problem mm -hmm. is that if the right hand side um, is in the image of the kernel, which also means uh, it is in the uh, kernel of the adjoint, mm -hmm. or let's say differently, if it's in the, yes, if it's a, no, that's correct what I said. Then. Uh, it's a little bit like if if you would take a very classical, uh, let's say, pendulum, and you would mm. force it at its natural frequency, the system, the solution to that problem will be uh, the product of time multiplied by a constant. So it's going to grow linearly in time. And so it would mean that U31 would grow linearly in time, and that would ruin the expansion because the expansion is built if you want to build uh, an asymptotic expansion like the first line here, you need U3 mm -hmm. to remain order one. It is not allowed to grow forever. Right. Whereas if you don't, if you're not careful to avoid that, um, this right hand side uh, <coughs> is mm -hmm. in the image uh, of the kernel, if you don't avoid that, then the, mm -hmm. the, there will be a, 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 a secular response which will grow if, if forever in time. Which will ruin the approximation. Okay. And so, yeah. one way to okay. avoid to avoid that uh, the right hand side is in the image of the kernel is also to ask that it is in the kernel of the adjoint. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. You can find that. Yeah, and that's what's called the uh, Friedel alternative. Yeah. So, so you just take the scalar product of the uh, of the red box by the forcing, if not by the yeah by the adjoint, if not sorry. And you, which is only, uh, only, only, you know, query for my side is that the what uh, I, my understanding about the federal alternative is that it is, uh, you know, like uh, it's uh, really what uh, you know established theory, maths theory is talking about the federal alternative on Banach spaces where there is no norm. It is the uh, sorry inner product. There is only norm. So I didn't that's understand. what. Uh, so what did you say about so, the inner product? Uh, Fredel alternatives works on the Banach spaces, the spaces where the inner product is not available, only the norm is available. So if you have the inner product, you have the norm. I don't understand the word. So, the knob, the knob, ah, the norm. Uh, yeah, no, yeah. Uh, so now, uh, I think you partially answered that question to the first uh, what is yeah, it the norm is not sufficient for me. I need, uh, I need, I need a, a scalar product. Yeah. So uh, it yeah. might be that if I want to generalize that to situations in which I have a norm which is not stemming from a from a scalar product, mm -hmm. then I, I mean, yeah. the, the way I proceed right now doesn't work. I would need to find another way to define um, the, the, let's say, the non-security condition. The yeah. one I'm doing works only because I have. Uh, I have a scalar product. I actually have a emission product. It doesn't. It's, it's yeah. not a scalar product. Yeah. 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 You you make a very Thank valid you. point here. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So uh, Satya, so you have a question. So please go ahead. Uh, yes. Thank you. So can you hear me? Yeah, I can. I can. Uh, okay. Thanks, Francois, for this nice talk. Um, so I have a question with. Stefan asked related because um, I just wanted to know what was the philosophy behind your multiple scale expansion like uh, how do you find the multiple scale I mean, how, how do you identify the there are presence of multiple scales so that you go for a multiple scale expansion yeah so among all the methods which work for uh, let's say classical resonators um, one is called central manifold Another one is called uh, multiple scale. Another one is called uh, Poincaré Lindstedt. Uh, I mean, there are many uh, different methods. Uh, first of all, uh, personally, the one I, I know the best, even in the classical case, is multiple scale, because it helps me to encompass also um, the distance from threshold. And I and 
it's it's like it's it's uh, actionable. So you can really follow the steps and get to uh, a, a amplitude equation. For instance, the central manifold or um, theory is very beautiful, as I think mathematically probably much stronger. Uh, but it is less easy to action because you need to find a nonlinear transformation of coordinates that transforms uh, that 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 creates the nonlinearities um, suitable, and so. There is actually a very interesting paper, uh, maybe eight or ten years ago, by Carini and others in JFM, who, and they do the central manifold approach for the cylinder case. Um, but I didn't find it easy to implement, whereas I find North Pascal approach quite easy to implement. So for me, the main reason to go for that method it's a method I understand and I know how to act, how to implement. Now, yeah. Uh, actually, in this problem, I think most of the methods, except maybe poincare lindstedt which is an averaging method, are suffering anyways uh, from the inexistence of a slow manifold. So in these non-normal problems, the spectrum doesn't tell me anything. So it's very difficult from scratch to construct a slow manifold. And so I think that now we, that we identified with the multiple scale approach how to do it, or one way to do it, let's say better, which is to to try to add, let's say to modify the in that case the um, inverse resolvent to correct the inverse resolvent. I think it could give us hints how to do how to bring back that method in the normal form framework, so in the central manifold framework. Yeah. So I, it's just that for me it was more intuitive to do it with multiple scale, a scale yes. for which I have not much intuition is capital T. Mm -hmm. So I need a slow T here yes. um, to keep uh, a slow time dependence. But I have to confess um, that I don't have a physical intuition for what this T is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I did bring it up at the you order for which, for which two it's... Two time scales, basically. Yes, and this second time scale, I have no clear idea where it could come from. Mm -hmm. Okay. But I want to be honest. Huh? Yeah. Okay, thank you. So, uh, thank you. Let's see if there is if there are some other questions uh, from from the audience. Just uh, once again, feel free to to unmute your mic or uh, to write in the chat. I can report it. That's that doesn't seem to to be the case. I mean, um, I had a fantastic question so far, so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that's... Uh... That, that's the most important. <laughs> it's already yeah, late I, in the day. Uh, so. Yeah, well, I think uh, I think the, the discussion was actually very, very active, so. Yeah, exactly. Uh, uh, yeah, so... I mean, because, because I use multiple scale in, I mean, different contexts, so that's why I was curious to know how do you identify the scales, because to have multiple scales, it's very important to identify the scales. Yes. Like, so here, the, the the slow time scale is formal. Yeah. I have no intuition mm -hmm. yeah. uh, for what it is. Mm -hmm. I cannot connect it to any easy property I could deduce from the equations. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Entrez. So, sorry, I have somebody uh, knocking on my door. Oh, no okay. So once again, uh, if there is someone else uh, who would like to ask a question, just uh, uh, last call. <laughs> it was a wrong, uh, it was a ghost. <laughs> okay, okay, so uh, uh, Francois, apparently there are no other questions and thank you once again for the, for the very beautiful talk. And I invite our audience to thank our speaker of today. And uh, thanks again also for, uh, for replying to so many questions. So thank you once again. Thanks a lot and hope to see you soon. Yes, yes. In real life. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Okay.